So, you want to play a magic punk RPG, but you also want to be able to understand the basic rules in a few minutes. Well, maybe you should check out Low Life 2090 by Pickpocket Press. This game was funded on Kickstarter back in 2020, and when I saw it was available for general purchase back in 2021, I said, this is a game I really want to review. Pickpocket Press was very gracious and sent me this hardbound cover and also sent me the PDF in order to do a review of this game. Other than that, I'm getting no compensation for it. This is my review of Low Life 2090. Let's roll it. So the print-on-demand copy that I got is a hardcover print-on-demand book. It is glued binding, so you don't see any of the signatures there. So it's not going to lay flat the way that the nice stitch binding books work, but it is put together pretty nice, and I expect that if you treat this well, it'll be fairly durable. Um, just being a glued book, I'm already noticing that there's some ripping on the inside of one of the pages uh, where the spine is kind of being stretched. But uh, really, it shouldn't be that much. If you're treating the book with care and storing it properly, it should turn out okay. Uh, it's just one of those things that go, you want this on demand? You got it. And it's perfect for small publishers that don't want to do limited print runs. Uh, one of the things that I really love about the book is the font. Uh, it is really wonderfully clear sans serif. Uh, when there are call-outs, it's usually cut out in a very nice, obvious space with a gray background. And the tables in this book are beautiful. Uh, just wonderful for heading row and title, and then the alternative rows or alternating rows in the main table makes it fairly easy to read. Every now and again, the columns are going to fold, which means they repeat the columns on one half to the other half. Uh, so it makes it a little bit confusing the first time you see it. Maybe if they put a line indicating where the break is, that would make things a little bit more simpler. But in general, it's designed very well. I also really love the fonts that they have used for the headers, especially for the title of the tables and then the main headers for each section. Just really, really beautiful. I love the comic book art. Uh, it's just stunning, fits the genre of this game perfectly. And then some of the bigger ones are almost watercolor-esque. And they really highlight the nature of this game so beautifully. And I just really, they knocked it out of the park. Let me bring that over a little bit, get it off the glare. They really did. With the, with the artwork, it's just utterly beautiful. Look at that car chase scene with the motion blur in the background. So nice. Larger tables, even when there's a lot of text in them, are still very easy to read. Again, they did a good job with those alternating rows, which is something that a lot of people just don't think of when they're doing their layout. And I like the color scheme overall. I think the, the brown and then kind of the off-color beige really fits. And it offsets nicely with the cool character art. This is a gorgeous book, and I mean, it's thick. That's 321 pages for a small independent publisher, and they did a very good job with it. Now, Low Life 2090 takes place in a dystopian, near-future, alternative Earth where magic has always existed. There have been six species that have existed on this planet throughout all of its history. You have the general fantasy tropes of human, elf, dwarf, and minotaur as a playable race, which is kind of cool. Added to this are the Spriggans, which are essentially Low Life 2090's version of goblins, and the Scorn, who are giant, hairless, almost giants, very similar to Goliaths from uh, 5e, if you're familiar with that game. The world as the players know it did not come from that accord to regulate magic. Instead, it came from something called CTAC, or the Catastrophic Mutagenic Arcane Contagion. I can't believe I actually remembered that. The CTEC spread through the entire world with a terrible pandemic. They're funding this in 2020 and they have a world that's dominated by a pandemic. So, I mean, way to be on point. Good job. And as CTEC spread across the world, the countryside and the suburbs were just utterly devastated. Millions of people died. 
and many more were horribly mutated, but some were transformed into something called ergots, which are horribly violent humanoids who just want to destroy everything. And that's the horrible nature of SeaTac. This remains to be a ever-present reality inside the world, and people are looking at SeaTac counts to, to see uh, what risk it is of going outside that day, the same way that we might look a weather report up. So this has really been a hugely influential force inside the world. And as the countryside and the suburbs were devastated, people moved into the cities, which couldn't spread out anymore, so they began to spread upward. They became the vert cities. These were the bastions of civilization and safety for ordinary people. And the default setting for Low Life 2090 is one of these vert cities called Mendoza City, named after the corporation which founded it during the height of the SeaTac crisis. So it's a really cool setting. I love how things got transformed and tweaked and how magic has always been part of this world and uh, how they made it dystopian. Really kind of cool. There are nine stats in the game. So there are the typical strength, dexterity, intelligence, constitution, and charisma. Wisdom is then split into perception and willpower which I like. Games which split out wisdom and give it two different foci, I, I really do enjoy because people are not necessarily good at both these things. And then there are two different derived stats. The first of these is initiative, which is the average of your strength and your dexterity rounded down. And the second of these is defense, which starts at 11 plus your dexterity modifier and then changes as your character progresses in levels. There's no armor class in the game. Defense essentially is your AC. And then the last attribute is luck. And this is a variable attribute, which you start out with a certain amount of luck for each of your jobs, which is essentially an adventure. And that can go down as you go through your job. Essentially, you make a luck check, which is a roll under mechanic, which we'll talk about in a little bit, which can either be straight up luck, which is your luck score, or luck modified by one of your attribute modifiers. And it's noted like this inside the rule book. Uh, you roll under it, you're successful, but your luck score goes down by one. Luck is typically only replenished in downtime between jobs, so the longer your job goes, you literally can feel as though your luck is running out. I love this mechanic. Luck is probably one of the coolest things that Low Life 2090 puts in or that the Low Fantasy engine really adds to gaming. I think this is spectacular. Just that sense of impending doom is, yes, I survived that huge blast, but now my luck score is down to five. And I really feel like, the next shot's going to get me. That's really cool. There are nine classes in the game, which go everywhere from a street brawler to a stunt driver. And you have cybernetic people, and you have technological mad geniuses, and wizards all in the mix as well. The nine classes, combined with the six playable races, give you a whole host of ways that you can play this game. You can approach it from so many different angles. It's a very good mix, and I thought they did a really good job. And leveling up is done by milestone. It, there's a couple versions of doing it. One of the most common ways is just to level people up after every job, but there's other ways to do it incrementally that are listed inside the book. It should be noted that you start with a certain number of hit points based on your character class and your personal stats, and then every level after that, you get one hit point. You are not going to be very beefy by the time you get to level 10. So it's a very different type of game than your normal hack and slash. Also, as your character advances, they will get special abilities. And there are a number that are listed inside this book, but Pickpocket Press does a very good job of explaining to players and to game masters that you should make your own special abilities. Sit down, talk, create something cool that fits into the world that you have all developed together, and make it part of your game. And the fact that Pickpocket is really leveraging the idea of homebrewing and making it part of the default rule, saying this isn't complete, go do your own thing, it's very much a part of the ethos of old school gaming, and I love that a lot. The engine that this game uses is essentially the same engine that low fantasy gaming, which is Pickpocket Press's first game, uses. 
it is for most checks a roll under mechanic using your stats, your ability scores for that roll under. What's cool about it is that there are also things called great successes and terrible failures. So if you roll under half of your ability score, this is a great success. And if you roll 1.5 times over your ability score, this is a terrible failure. Gets to be a little crunchy, but I do kind of like this. The great successes and the terrible failures are essentially just normal failures, but with narrative consequences that go in. So say you roll to attack someone and you miss violently and you go way beyond what your target is. So you not only miss your target, but you hit a steam vent that's now blowing scalding steam out. You can't pursue them anymore and you're gonna to have to take another path in order to get the information that you wanted. So great successes and terrible failures, they kind of add a lot of narrative pushes inside the game when they happen. I like that idea a lot. Opposed roles are probably the most crunchy part of the game. So you have two different characters, oftentimes a PC and an NPC, who are going to do an opposed role. Doesn't necessarily have to be the same stat. It just has to be a stat that corresponds to what one of the players is trying to do. So say a player character wants to grapple someone and they have a lot of strength, so that's really good. But the person who's trying to get away from them has a very high dexterity and they want to be able to wiggle out of the, the hold that the person tries to get on them. So they roll an opposed roll. Now, say the person who has strength is relatively strong. They have like a 13 strength, so they're, they're, they're pretty bulky, but they're not huge meatheads, right? But the person who is dexterous has like a 17. So they should have a benefit to this, right? They're more dexterous than the other person is strong. How does Little Life 2090 handle this? Well, what it does is it says in an opposed role that whoever has the greatest margin of success is the one who wins the opposed role. So if you have a 13 strength and you roll an eight, your margin of success is five. If you are in the opposed role and you have a dexterity of 17 and you roll a 10, technically you roll a higher number, but your margin of difference is seven. You succeed. Now that's crunchy. People don't like that a lot of times, but it's really fast. It's one subtraction problem to do in order to determine it. And I like the fact that it really leverages on the idea that these attribute scores mean something. The last role under mechanic that exists in the game are percentile checks. These function very much like old school thief skills. Uh, you have a certain target number that you have to get with a D100. You have to get that number or roll below. It works, I'm used to it. Like I said, it's part of old school D&D and that's what I grew up with. But inside this game where everything is handled by a D20, the sudden appearance of a percentile check, especially in stats, it just looks weird. Once you get used to it, it functions, but it's, it's out of place in this game. Attacks are different in that they are a rollover mechanic. Every character, PC or NPC in the game, has a defense rating, and that is your target to roll over. Um, so just one little shift in the game, but I, I kind of like that. I have not really taken to a lot of the modern dynamics where it's always the players trying to roll under their score or trying to beat their score in order to hit someone else. I like the idea that targets have a defense rating you have to beat in order to make a hit. And, you know, we're used to now having high scores being better for defense rather than low scores it does make more sense. And so a roll over to succeed in an attack, well, that works. Uh, folks might want a everything being the same role inside of a game. They're kind of used to that, but it's one little switch and it fits inside the game itself. As I said, there's no armor class in the game, so that if you get hit, your defense rating is really what is gonna be balanced off of that. What armor does in the game is it mitigates damage. So if you have an armor rating of two or three or one, it's gonna take one of those hit points away from whatever damage is rolled against you. Uh, but some of the weapons in this game do a whole heck of a lot of damage. So just go into Low Life 2090 recognizing this is not a murder hobo game. You are not going to be walking up to everybody and getting into combat 
If you do that, you're going to die pretty quickly. You really need to role play through the situation in order to attain the goals that you need to achieve your score. And if you're going to get into combat, make sure it's in a very favorable place. It's a very nice way that they've laid it out. And they're trying organically to make it that you don't want to get into combat a whole lot. It's scary. So well done on that point. So when you do get into an encounter, I love how they do initiative. Initiative is literally one of your attributes. And so initiative is an attribute check. You have to roll a d20 and roll under your initiative to succeed. Every character who succeeds in the initiative check will go before the NPCs. Every character who rolls over their initiative check will go after the NPCs. So essentially you have group initiative, but you can have multiple groups, people who succeed, the NPCs, and people who fail. Inside those groups, the players will determine among themselves who's gonna go what. So if you want to have an action that builds off someone else's action, you can say, hey, you go first, and that's how they work it out. There are, however, some characters in the game who have a quick to act ability. These are usually like heavies, which maybe are like mini bosses, and then bosses who are bosses. And if you want to go before them, you have to have a great success on your initiative check. Uh, th again, that's really cool. So you add another level of intrigue into the way initiative works. It's really kind of cool. I want to play a game just to see how this works in combat because I think it would be a lot of fun. Like I said, damage can be brutal in this game, but when you hit zero HP, you are not automatically dead. Instead, you have to roll a luck check with your constitution score modified against it. If you succeed, well, then you roll on a kind of catastrophic injury table. And this could be from temporary effects all the way up to things that, well, you need cybernetics in order to replace the arm that got chopped off. If you fail the luck check, then you're dead. So this is a nice balance. You still have a second chance to live once you hit zero HP, but if you fail, then it's just one shot and you're out. So a lot of tension inside combat, but not necessarily zero HP, okay, go roll up a new character. The magic system itself is really cool. One thing you cannot get is cybernetics because it screws up your connection to that arcane energy and it lowers your ability to cast spells. Every time you cast a spell, you have to make a willpower check. And for every bit of cyberware that you have on your person, your willpower is minus two for that check. If you succeed that check, your willpower is reduced by one. It actually increments back up once per day and the magic happens. If you fail, uh, well, the magic goes awry and you have to roll on the dark flux table to see how the arcane energy is corrupting you. Some funny comical effects that are in that table and there's things that are quite a bit more serious. So casting a spell is something you gotta think twice about. Is this something I wanna risk in this situation? It's not your typical fancy and magic where, yeah, it's just a slot, I burn it, we're done. There's a little bit of risk involved and it's really simple. It's not a huge amount of work to figure out what consequences you have for failing. Well done on the magic system. It adds a lot of flavor and a little bit of danger, which I like. All in all, Low Life 2090 is a really interesting game. I love the way that it is put together. I love how it looks. I love the way the engine works. And the setting is pretty darn cool. So if you want to play a Magic Punk game that you can figure out pretty quickly and get up and running really fast, this is something you want to check out. You can go on Drive-Thru RPG and get a PDF of Low Life 2090 for $20 at present. You want to get a hardcover book and a PDF bundle that'll cost you $50. And a premium bundle with a premium hardback book and PDF is currently $75. There is no soft bound option for this game, but the book is 371 pages long and a soft bound book of that magnitude is just totally cumbersome to actually use. So good for them to just sticking for the hardback, trying to give their readers the best options available. So from a poll that I ran almost two months ago, people really wanted me to review the original adventures reincarnated version of Keep on the Borderlands. So I'm going to be reviewing Into the Borderlands. Until next we meet, happy playing everyone.